introduction. Um, uh, Dr. Bob or Dr. Robert Mara is an associate agricultural scientist with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And this morning he is uh, discussing beech leaf disease and the newly described nematode that causes it. So let's see here, Bob, I've unmuted your microphone and I don't know if you want to turn on your um, your video feed and introduce yourself. I do welcome you to share any other information that's important that I might have missed. And thank you again so much for talking to us all today. All right. <clears throat> okay, so briefly, I think I've got my camera on now. Yep, you're good. Okay, so yeah, just I'm gonna be real brief here because I've got, I think, a lot of material here to cover and we need time for those poll questions. Um, yep, so uh, I started working on beech leaf disease uh, Back in 2019, when we first found it, first first finding of it in New England was in Fairfield County. Simultaneous with that, it was found in the lower two counties of uh, of New York State as well as on Long Island. Um, and since then, since 2019, it is now found in every one of our eight counties. It is now found. The following year, it was found in Eastern Massachusetts, and then now it's in. I think every county of Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken, and it's all the way up in Maine um, and down in Virginia. So this disease has spread quite rapidly. And some of that, what we call spread, might very well be conflated with increased surveillance. All right, so let me get started on that talk. If you could um, undo my camera, or I should do it. I don't know how you do this. I, I should be able to get it. There you go. Oh, great. Okay. All right, so beech leaf disease. Um, and I want to start talking about the disease. And in plant pathology, we often will talk about a disease before we talk about the cause of the disease. And those two things should not be conflated. So for example, chestnut blight is not the fungus. It is the disease caused by the fungus. And that's an important, um, an important distinction to make. Uh, I'm seeing a warning here that I may be experiencing network connection difficulties uh, so um, I'm hoping that that's not the case. Uh, you sound, you still sound great. All right, great. So I'll ignore that that warning. Um, all right. So beech leaf disease. Let's see if I can get my. All right. So this disease, and I, I remember very well. It's quite vivid in my memory when pictures were being sent around that showed symptoms like we're seeing in this photograph here among the forest pathology community that included myself and other plant pathologists who work on diseases of trees in the forest. Um, and just asking, has anybody seen anything like this before? Because it sure doesn't look like anything anybody else that folks in Ohio had seen before. And it was quite a mystery what this um, stripey thing is that's seen on some leaves and some beech trees in Ohio. And what was found was because there's an arboretum up in that part of Ohio in Lake County along the southern shore of, of the lake there, um, was that it was affecting not just American beech, but also European beech and the not very commonly planted, but we have them around here in places, uh, Oriental beech. Uh, and so that's Fagus grandifolia, our native beech, Sylvatica, European beech, and Orientalis, the Oriental beech. So we all know what American beech looks like. It's the tree in our forest that has this smooth gray bark and this very light green foliage that really has an impact on what the light is like that hits our forest floors. So in 2019, what you're seeing here, I don't know, can you see my cursor when I move it over the slides? Yep. Okay, so there's Lake County where I'm moving my cursor. That was where it was first seen in 2012 and in subsequent years, all the way up to 2019, it had only been found in Western New York and Western PA. And then all of a sudden we find it here in Fairfield County, Putnam and Westchester counties and, and on Long Island uh, in 2019. Um, what was the case here? Was it a matter of just lack of surveillance or that somehow the, the cause of the disease had moved this far, uh, jumped across, uh, these states. It, we, we don't know, and I still don't have an answer to that question. Um, but it did arouse concern in the Forest Service and among a lot of people. Um, where it occurred in Fairfield County and Long Island, it seemed to be pretty, pretty widespread. No one had noticed it the year before. And as we'll learn as I go through this talk, 
as we'll learn, uh, if you see it in one year, that means it was here the year before. Um, so in 2020, the Forest Service initiated um, uh, a long-term monitoring plot network in, engaging every state, if they so wish to, to cooperate and set up long-term monitoring plots. So uh, I stepped in for Connecticut and put in eight, uh, sorry, 11 in eight of our counties and a couple of few counties we have two. Um, and also to do distribution surveys, basically to go out looking for the disease. And what we found in Connecticut here, um, what you're seeing is the, the, um, the red pluses are indicating where we found beech leaf disease that year in 2020. And you can see other than a couple of spots in Litchfield County, most of where we found it, one little spot right on the border of, of Wyndham County, most of these uh, occurrences we found were along the shoreline or about 15 to 20 miles in. Um, the, 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 the blue crosses or pluses are where we have uh, our long-term monitoring plots. You can see we have them distributed fairly evenly around the state. Uh, and then green indicates every place where we looked but couldn't find it. Um, by 2020, though, as a result of this uh, co cooperative agreements with the, with the uh, Forest Service, we did find it in eastern Massachusetts. Another county showed up positive in New York State. And it, we, it was found more widely in Pennsylvania than we originally thought. Um, so that was 2020. Then in 2021, again, more surveillance, but also more occurrences. We were pretty confident. It was looked for pretty carefully here. And all of a sudden, even though the folks in Maine were looking for it, you can see that by 2021, um, three, four, four counties in Maine were affected by, by beech leaf disease. Um, New Jersey was finding it, Virginia, a positive site or potentially positive site um, in West Virginia, more of Pennsylvania. And then in 2022, you can see we keep filling out these, this map to show the distribution, uh, New Hampshire, Southern Maine, um, all of Massachusetts, all of Connecticut, uh, and much of Pennsylvania now has beech leaf disease. Um, and it's probably occurring it, it, oddly, um, although Ohio was the, are the folks that started this whole thing, um, just teasing, but uh, also I should mention Ontario. Uh, Ontario, Canada has it, Michigan has a site, um, but it's not found much, much west or south of where it's currently found in Ohio. Um, and you can be sure that they're, they're looking very, very uh, assiduously there. Okay, so why don't we stop now and you'll get your poll question number one, and then uh, you, you, you'll let me know when I can start up again. Absolutely, and just a reminder again to everyone and anyone who needs pesticide or association credits or CEUs, um, please do answer this poll question. If you have trouble answering the poll question through the prompt, uh, in GoToWebinar, you can also enter your name and your answer to the poll question in the questions or chat area on the control panel. But hopefully folks will be able to vote using the GoToWebinar function here. We'll give this about 10 more seconds for any last few people who want need to answer this poll. Okay, the poll is closed. And here are the results. 93% um, said Ohio, 4% said Ontario, 2 Iowa, and 1 Oregon. Okay, it's back to you, Bob. All right. So this is not this is probably the easiest disease I've ever encountered in terms of di diagnosing um, 
some diseases are much, much harder and require quite a bit of lab work to confirm that what you're seeing is the thing that you think it is. But in this case, it's unmistakable, as you can see in this picture here. So these um, surveys that we do um, are easy when it looks like this, but not so easy when it looks like this. And this is taken, this picture was taken uh, fully zoomed in. This is pretty high up in the canopy. Um, that arrow is actually misplaced on my slide and I apologize for that. Um, what you'll see is that where it really should be, that arrow should have been pointed on this leaf here. Um, so right here. Um, and I will say that looking up into the canopy when you're doing hours of survey work and you've had your neck crooked back and you're staring up into canopies, a lot of things start looking like beech leaf disease. Every place where leaves overlap, for example, they, they present this sort of darker image that can look like banding. But this one intrigued us. Um, and so we were able to, uh, there were two of us in this particular survey, so we were able to um, hike someone up on my shoulders who grabbed the branch and we took that leaf back to the lab and confirmed that this was uh, the, uh, this truly was beech leaf disease. And what this tells us is that there's gonna be a lot of times in survey work, especially during early stages of infestation, when had the light been wrong, had the wind been higher, you you would miss easily miss incidences like this where you have one leaf on one tree in, in, a, in a site otherwise where you haven't found it, where you would declare the site uninfected when in fact you have the initial stages of beech leaf disease. So I'm presenting now here what has been kind of the paradigm of disease progression. And then I'm gonna talk about how a lot of what we observed last year sort of broke a lot of those, just the, uh, the paradigm that we sort of built about how disease progresses with beech leaf disease. So it's important to understand early season, the leaves emerge fully symptomatic. And those are the only symptoms that you will see. The only portions of leaves that are symptomatic upon leaf out are the only symptoms you'll see for the entire season. Uh, the bands, are, you see this darkened banding, especially when you're looking at the undersides of the leaves with light from behind. So looking up into the canopy, um, we'll, we'll look for at a moment, we'll see what, what, what I mean by hypertrophy, the sort of uh, uh, heightened growth, and no new symptoms appear during growing season. Um, that, that's important, and it's also important when we get into talking about the causal organism, which is not an insect, by, by the way. Um, so again, looking up at these leaves, you see this darkened banding. This is the underside of the leaf, and you can see how this particular intervenal band is extending out past the leaf margin. That's an example of this hypertrophy, um, this cupping, when you look at the upper side of the leaf here, I'm moving my cursor along these inter intervenal bands, uh, they're, they're cupping as a result of this um, extensive uh, uh, growth, more cell divisions, um, larger cells as microscopy has revealed. Um, so yeah, looking at from above, you can see the cupping here that is um, typical, this hypertrophy. That's, that leaf we looked at from the underside is this leaf right here. And there's this sort of looks like an overgrown fingernail, but this um, extensive growth where it's gone past the leaf margin. Um, later in the season, the, the paradigm was that everything gets darker, these, this banding gets darker. Some, some intervenal bands actually completely complete necrosis and they fall out. And you'll see this. A lot of this is going to be what kind of interactions you're seeing with weather patterns, which we have had a lot of unusual, uh, of which we've had a lot unusual weather patterns, like extensive drought in the summertime, extensive heat, like last year. Um, but this is what you can see, not always, but can see uh, later in the season. Um, in subsequent seasons, you're more likely to see aborted buds. So buds that just don't develop at all. So I'm pointing here with my cursor to aborted or misshapen bud development, the, all these leaves here. This is what they look like upon leaf out and it's what they'll look like for the entire season and also buds that just don't develop at all. Canopy, of course, this results in a thinner canopy and, you, and we've seen that especially this past year. And ultimately in some disease saplings, you can see mortality, especially in younger trees. 
in two to five years from when disease was first noticed. Um, now I'm going to be showing pictures from a state park near here and here near here in New Haven, near where the, where we are at the experiment station, West Rock Ridge State Park, and what 2022 looked like and how it really kind of blew some holes in those paradigm that paradigm that we had sort of come to expect based on what folks in Ohio and Ontario were reporting since they had more years of experience with the disease. And it was more mature trees like this this tree here, completely, un, I wanna say unfoliated, not defoliated, because they never produced leaves. The, they had nearly complete uh, aborted buds, nearly 100% aborted buds. Um, or where they did have leaf out, like in this sapling here along this trail, a few fully formed leaves with bands, but for the rest of the branches on this particular sapling, either no buds uh, uh, leafed out or the, the, they leafed out into these completely darkened, shrunken leaves. What we were calling late season symptoms that were really just um, you know, first of spring symptoms. Uh, here's another example. It's, these are hard to, to depict. They, they're, it's a more vivid um, thing to see this in, in real time or in person, but you can see these dark, darker leaves here. And this is this, this particular sapling um, here again. Uh, and it wasn't just the smaller trees, it was even mature trees uh, in the upper canopy with a lot of aborted buds or buds that had pushed out very misshapen leaves. Um, this was unexpected. And this, is, this was seen up and down the coast. And this was seen, this is not the result of third year infestation because in Maine, where they'd only seen beech leaf disease for the first time in 2021, the preceding year, they saw symptoms like this uh, that look no different than what we were seeing here um, in Connecticut. Uh, so it's not a matter of three years of beech leaf disease so much as it seems to be uh, a function of other factors that could involve perhaps weather, uh, weather patterns as well. So this led us to, for at least to me, to describe this as the 2022 BLD hellscape, because um, this alerted a lot of people who had been marginally concerned or even dismissive of beech leaf disease up to 2021, now recognizing that we were looking at something that was far more serious um, because of these kinds of symptoms. Uh, all these things that were described as, you know, uh, third year symptoms or late season symptoms were really appearing for the first time in areas where we had not seen it the year before. Interestingly, last year, in some of these trees that produce few or no leaves, we saw a secondary leaf flush in some cases in the spring, in only a very few cases though, a lot of trees never did this. Um, what we noticed is these secondary leaf flushes these leaves never produce the dentate margins that you see on mature first flush leaves. They kind of stayed like this. They stayed somewhat chlorotic. Um, and, and interestingly, because of the drought last year and the heat, there were some trees that remained leafless all summer long. And then with our first late summer, early fall rains, flushed out quite large cohorts of leaves that also were late in, uh, in changing uh, color. Um, and I saw this on some oaks as well, interestingly, uh, because of the, the weather patterns that we had last summer. Okay, and with that, I'll hand it over to you for uh, poll question number two. So for people who might be unable to see the poll question pop up on their screen because you're using something small like a smartphone, I'll read the question. So the question is, birch leaf, beech leaf disease symptoms first appear in, then your choices are fall, spring, summer, uh, or season three of the symptoms. If you can't answer this on the screen, uh, you can put your answer into the, the questions box.
10 more seconds to get your answers in. And this is closed. Okay. So here were the responses. 87% said spring, 9% said summer, 3% said fall, and 1% thought it was the season of the symptoms. Okay. Well done, folks. All right. Now, beech leaf disease. We know now for sure that the causal organism is a foliar nematode, um, newly named um, by nematologists uh, in Ohio and at, U at USDA, Lytelenchus crenate, and named subspecies Macanii because described around the same time was Lytelenchus crenate, subspecies crenate, uh, known only in Japan so far on Japanese beach, Fagus crenata. They describe these as blister galls on the foliage. They do have not documented mortality. They've not seen any kind of decline. Um, and it's not been very, very well studied uh, in Japan because of the fact that it's not really caused anything that they would consider uh, a concern on their native beach, neither Fagus crenata nor Fagus japonica. Um, so you're looking at pictures here of what the nematode looks like. It forms both females and males. Uh, we know now, thanks to some very good work done by another USDA scientist, Dr. Paolo uh, Vieira, uh, that the females are parthenogenetic, so they can produce eggs without the involvement of a male partner. Um, and there's more that we're we're doing to learn uh, to learn more about this nematode since it is newly described. What we know about foliar nematodes in general, although we have no experience with foliar nematodes of trees, is foliar nematodes require water films on the outside of the leaf in order to move, and they will often be induced to exit leaves through stomates once there is a water film on the outside of the leaf. And so in the presence of water on the outsides of leaves, juveniles and adults will exit and enter through the stomata and any wet event of any kind, it can be dew, it can be uh, a light rain, will trigger egress of nematodes from leaves. And we'll talk in a moment about what they do when they leave. They, When they exit leaves, they will often just enter another part of another leaf or the same leaf and again enter through stomates so that's how they move around they can get splashed from leaf to leaf um and we're as i say we're learning more um uh, as far as the transmit uh, transmission of the nematode is concerned very little is known lots of speculation just based on common sense local movement via rain splashes is, is seems likely intermediate and long distance transmission we suspect vectors like insects and mites and birds and mammals could be involved. These little nematodes are sticky. Uh, whether or not they passage through bird gut, given that overwintering birds like finches regularly feed on beach buds, that's being investigated, but we don't know for sure. And we also, but we do know for sure that nurseries, wholesale nurseries uh, with European beach stock, uh, it has turned up on European beach stock. And so that's another way, although it seems like a less uh, probably not playing a major role in transmission, um, but it is another way that that uh, these can that the nematode can be moved around, especially given that people will buy dormant trees when they're still in dormancy, um, and there's no way to know if those if those nematodes are uh, uh, in in that tree. And I I want to mention, by the way, as far as the life cycle of the nematode is concerned, that in spring, one of the reasons why the nematode was not at first considered likely cause, a cause is that upon first leaf flush, when you have symptoms, you will not observe nematodes bringing leaves back to the lab, putting them in water. Nematodes are not exiting leaves, whether because they're just recalcitrant, their numbers are low, they're not induced, or perhaps all the nematodes that would have overwintered in the buds, and I haven't mentioned yet, by the way, that the nematode overwinters in buds, um, that it might be that all, all that's left are eggs uh, in, the, in the leaves. Um, but either way, it isn't until midsummer, like July, that we will start to see nematodes exiting leaves in the lab when we put those leaves in water. Um, I developed a marker, that's a rapid marker that we can use very quickly 
to determine whether or not a leaf has nematode in it, and that can be in the form of eggs or, or juveniles or adults, and showed that in these bands where we took small little samples from leaves, in these bands, the distribution of the nematode is not, is not uniform throughout. It's spotty. And so that suggests that perhaps there are little clumps of eggs left in there, but we don't know for sure yet. Um, there's more work being done microscopically by Dr. Vieira down at, in Beltsville. Um, so one thing, another thing about the life cycle of the nematode, we know that population densities of juveniles and adults increase dramatically through autumn. And with that, nematodes begin migrating from leaves into buds. And if you go and look at a beech tree, like most trees, you'll see that there are buds at the base of most leaves. There's a little bud that's forming and enlarging uh, through summer into fall. In winter, we find all stages of the nematodes in the buds. I, I'm bringing, collecting buds, having buds sent to me, and we can easily obtain viable nematodes. Doesn't matter how cold it's gotten, um, we can get viable nematodes out of buds all winter long. And what Dr. Vieira has no, noted now with his microscopic work is that when we see buds aborted or leaves emerging misshapen, this is due to heavy and in, heavy infestation of these buds by nematodes and they're, ba and they're damaging the leaf primordia. And if, they're, if there's a lot of nematodes in those buds, they can do so much damage that the buds just don't, they abort completely. They don't, they don't, emer they don't emerge or flush leaves at all. Uh, Sharon Reed up in Ontario did a, a large study where she showed the populations of nematodes collected from leaves from May into August. And this, this, this uh, growth rate increases into September and October where the numbers just explode. Um, and what we, and I just wanna also show that bud infestation in the autumn, when we, when we bring some of these back to the lab or, or even in the spring, when you look at, at a branch say, you'll note that, that infestation of a branch will be variable or can be variable. And you'll also note that leaf cohorts, like this cohort of two leaves that emerge from one bud, often are correlated whether they are symptomatic or not. So these two leaves that emerge from a bud are asymptomatic, same thing with these two, whereas each of these clusters of leaves are all symptomatic and all emerged from a single bud. Again, pointing to the importance of whether or not nematodes got into a bud during that course in the fall, uh, in fall when, when they're migrating from leaves into buds. It's not that they're triggered by autumn to start initiating some sort of a march. Um, that's that's, that's a, 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 a mistaken notion of what's happening here. Their populations increase, more nematodes are eg exiting leaves every time there's a wet event, and buds are getting larger and larger, so they become larger targets, and they are just attractive to nematodes. So uh, Dr. Lynn Carter down at USDA showed a couple of years ago that the nematodes, even if you place a, a bud on a Petri dish in a lab, the nematodes will swim towards buds and, and get themselves sort of intercalated in between the, those bud scales where they begin to cause tissue deformations and damage. And so my, my point about symptoms correlating with bud leaf cohorts is, is exemplified here in this in this photograph where you can see every single one of the six leaves that emerged from this bud asymptomatic all three leaves here symptomatic it's very very typical okay and time for your last final poll question i'll read the question uh, you should see it on your screen but for those who can't the question is the beech leaf disease nematode overwinters in and the choices are soil, buds, bark, or bird poop. I'll read that again. Beach leaf, beech leaf disease nematode overwinters in soil, buds, bark, or bird poop.
10 more seconds before we end this poll. And here are the results. 90% said buds, 6% said soil, 3% said bark, and 1% said bird poop. Okay, back to you, Bob. Do you want to review okay. any of that? Oh, no, I don't think we need to review it. We don't know for sure about bird poop. I mean, I put that in as a sort of a joke kind of question, but um, so far it's not really clear, um, And that, but that research is ongoing. Okay, so where we are now, I just want to show some really wonderful micrographs made by Dr. Lynn Carta uh, at USDA in leaf cross sections, the difference between an uninfected leaf in the upper left hand corner here. These are cross sections of a leaf. So this is the underside, this is the upper side. So abaxial, adaxial, this is a, a leaf, vein, leaf vein bundle. You can see the um, spongy mesophyll, uh, the palisade layer here. And this is what, it, what an infected leaf looks like. What you're also seeing here is the casts of nematodes uh, in this in this micrograph, we can see the damage is extensive. Um, and just a better picture here, just more close up of the healthy leaf with the more organized tissue. And here you see the infected leaf um, where there's been a lot of damage done to these leaves. Uh, Dr. Vieira has also shown this is a, a, a cleared leaf. So these are the, the veins in the leaf and you can see everything that's pink here is nematode so this is a late autumn leaf this is how densely populated the nematodes are in these leaves we get in the fall can take one leaf put it in water and we can get tens of thousands of nematodes out of one leaf or even a portion of a leaf um, this is what eggs look like in a cleared leaf uh, so th this is um, just demonstrating how uh, how abundantly this this nematode is populating these these leaves. Okay, with that, um, I have time for questions. I guess I just want to say I haven't talked about control. There is some work being done on control. It's not an area of research that I'm focusing on myself. Uh, Dr. Vieira and I, I I applied for and got a grant. I'll be going to Japan next year with Paolo and a couple of U.S. Forest Service scientists to look for the origin of of the disease and, and get a better idea of how uh, Lydilinchus crenate crenate is impacting Japanese speech so we can sort of do a comparative population genetic study there. Um, but there has been some, some interesting work done on control for landscaping trees. None of these approaches would have any relevance in our forests. Okay, I'm, I'm ready for questions. Excellent, and certainly if you want to expand on anything, you've given us plenty of time, but there are also lots of questions already waiting and more coming in, so I'll just get started with those. Um, awesome presentation and comments from me and <laughs> uh, participants coming in as well. Um, my first question here comes from um, Michael. Um, will, let's see, I wanna make sure I get this right. Will we be able to include a discussion of likely outcomes of the infestation, which um, I think you did cover some of that, uh, and any countermeasures? Michael asks, for lack of a better term, is beach toast? And I get asked that a lot, as you can imagine, and it, there's nothing wrong with that question, but I just think it's important to put into context that one, we don't have a template off of which to to try and even make educated guesses about what's going to happen in the future with, with beech. Um, we don't have a, a, pr a previous experience with a foliar nematode of a tree, for example. Um, you know, we understand how vascular wilt fungi, for example, how that might change the, the um, what kind of impact that might have on a tree in a forest, but we don't have prior experience. We can't, we can't say, we can't use our experience with beech bark disease, for example, to determine, which is a cankering disease, to determine what happens with it with a disease that exclusively impacts the foliage and causes things like branch and tip dieback. Um, we have only three or four years of experience in, in New England here 
with the disease. Um, we're, also see, we're also seeing interactions with other things that are impacting our forests, for example, climate change, all of which we have no prior experience to look back and say, the last time we had 420 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, what happened to our forests? The last time we had long periods of, of, of long summers of drought and heat, what happened to our forests? And also interactions with other diseases and other disturbances. So we're, we're really, we're, we're just trying to describe the disease and see what's happening here. You know, we, we thought we could use what was observed in Ohio as a template for what, uh, what we could predict would happen in New England, and that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, is there genetic variation for, for resistance to the nematode? We don't know yet. All of these things are gonna take years to study. Um, just studying what is gonna to happen to forest structure um, is are just the kinds of things that we need years of data. These long-term plots, we're collecting lots of data at each of these plots. Um, and I think that's gonna be how we're gonna get a better idea of what happens to new recruits, the saplings in the understory, for example. Um, there's lots we have yet to learn, but but we just ask people to be patient while we you know, make our, our observations and try to collect our data as carefully as we can so that we can then look back on the data we've collected. Um, the story about control is uh, a, a whole different story because again, it really only impacts um, landscaping trees. Um, and I, I just didn't want to get into that because it's still under research and still um, there are a lot of questions left. Thank you. There are so many awesome questions coming in from folks. Don't spend any time on this, but I had a question and you touched on it with climate change. I just want to ask, is anyone looking at climate change as a driver of this? Do we think maybe... I know this sounds funny to say this with all the issues with drought we've been experiencing, but more frequent rain events at certain times of the year? Does that presumably help its life cycle? Yeah, well, yes, actually. I mean, I guess I hinted at it and I didn't dwell on it, but I, I use the term wet events. Um, if you, monthly monthly average or average monthly rainfall, seasonal averages are less important than how frequently you have rain. So if you have a quarter of an inch of rain four times in a month versus two inches of rain once, that's gonna impact the nematode's ability to migrate because the nematode, if there's no water on the surface of the leaf, the nematode stays inside those leaves. Those leaves then ultimately senesce and sometimes dehiss and sometimes don't, as, as we all know with beech. Um, those dehissed leaves, if they're symptomatic on the forest floor, the rate of survival of the nematodes in those leaves is much lower than, than, than the rate of survival in buds, where, as I say, no matter how cold it gets, there is quite a high survival rate of nematodes inside buds um, where they feed. They, they, the, one of the things we're going to be looking at is looking at the, the genetics of the interaction between the nematode and, the, and, and leaf tissue to see what sorts of... of effector molecules are changing the structure of the leaf in the way that they seem to. Um, but as far as climate change is concerned, it does introduce, it's a, it's a disturbance, it's clear, it's unmistakable. Um, but yeah, uh, the drought is a, is a stressor on trees, so that could add to the, to the likelihood of tree failure. And then if you have all of your wet events in the fall, those are, each of those are going to be an opportunity for nematodes to migrate into buds. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, all right, I'll keep going with the audience questions, comments. Gary says, we are already seeing all of these beech leaf disease symptoms in Maine. It hits trees with beech bark disease really hard and it seems to be causing mortality already. Gary also asks, or says, you have a great presentation, Bob. Could you share some of the microscopy? I wanted to use this as an opportunity to tell the whole audience that both um, PDFs of the PowerPoints for today for both Bob's talk and Nicole's coming up are in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. So you should all right now be able to download directly from GoToWebinar 
a PDF uh, handout of all of these uh, slides. But also, uh, Bob, if, if you would like Gary's email address, he offers that as well. Oh <laughs> uh, Yeah, what I would suggest is that, because I haven't taken those micrographs, but I would suggest contacting the scientist. And if you, um, they're at the USDA, the micrographs. Lynn Carter has um, uh, has retired, but Paolo Vieira um, is still very active. We, we're collaborators on a lot of work right now. And um, you, it would be better that you get permission directly from from uh, from Paolo to use the micrographs. Um, I don't know what the politics are of someone who's retired, but I can find out if you're interested. Um, and, and as far as beach bark disease is concerned, we are collecting lots of data on beach bark disease in, our long, in these long-term plots. Um, it, every state was gonna be putting out weather monitors, temperature and, and relative humidity monitors. Turns out I'm the only state that has uh, those data loggers on our plots, but we are collecting weather data and they can be obtained locally as well. But we are very interested in observing how sites with beach bark disease, uh, how what the interaction is between beach leaf disease and beach bark disease in terms as uh, in terms of um, being sort of cumulative stressors on on trees. Awesome. Thank you so much. More audience questions here. Um, let's see, from Gavin, in early succession forests with dense beach saplings on the forest floor, is heavy clearing a recommend, recommended prevention tactic now? That's a good question, and it's, it seems like a reasonable assumption, but as you can imagine, there's been no research done doing these kinds of these different types of management strategies and then observing the impact. I mean, even if even if those kinds of um, controlled experiments were done, and I don't think any has been done yet, this would be up to someone to try to get funding to do that kind of management experiment. It would take years to to determine what the impact is on on the differential impact on forest structure that that would result. Um, is it a good idea? It seems like a good idea. I mean, it, it, it's common sense would suggest that it might be. Um, to what degree those saplings are, are uh, clonal root sprouts versus seed started would, I guess, determine whether or not um, you might be saving a, a mature tree if you were to reduce the stress imposed by its understory saplings, especially since in the case of beech leaf disease, it seems like the saplings are what get more heavily infested um, versus with beech bark disease, where it's it's the ex, it's the ex, accelerated state of beech bark disease in the mature tree that induces the the root sprouts. So you have this these sort of complementary situations um, between the eight, the age eight structure. Uh, in a beach bark disease, uh, and especially in an advanced stage of beach bark disease compared to what we're seeing so far with beach leaf disease. Another difference is, is that we have 120 years of observations with beach bark disease, where we have only a few years of observations with beach leaf disease. Thank you. Uh, let's see, next question, and I might be able to combine two folks' questions here. Uh, from Alan and Jack, um, are all beach species susceptible uh, for beach leaf disease? For example, tricolor beach, um, maybe since it's a hybrid, are there less chances to get beach leaf disease? And this goes along with Jack's question, just essentially to clarify for everyone, um, what are what exactly are the hosts? Is there any evidence that beech leaf disease, the nematode, could affect, um, say, blueberry bushes or other plants nearby uh, heavily impacted beech? Um, as far as all other hosts, um, what we know so far is that in a few arboreta, uh, for example, the Holden Arboretum in Ohio nearby plantings of of Japanese beech, Fagus cronata, um, are, are not getting infected by this, what we're calling a subspecies of the nematode. Um, but controlled experiments haven't been done to confirm that that is the case. Um, 
Interest, interestingly, although much, much less work has been done in Japan on, on the nematode there, in Arboreta there, where there are nearby plantings of, of American beech and European beech, those blister galls, as they call them, were not observed on, on the European and American beach. As far as other hosts are concerned, um, I don't know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of a hybrid. Um, all of these other cultivars, so-called cultivars of European beach, lace leaf, uh, copper beach, the fastigiate versions, um, they're all just cultivars of European beach. There may be a, cult, uh, a hybrid, but not with American beach as far as I know. Um, and European beach is susceptible. The first sightings of the first confirmations we had in Eastern Mass of beech leaf disease uh, was on European beaches. I think we don't see as much of it because mostly European beaches are often planted as solitary specimen trees where they're not as near to uh, a grove or a stand of infected American beaches, um, but they are susceptible. I think it would be really hard to see symptoms on something like lace leaf beach. Uh, it is hard to make out the symptoms on copper beach, although um, if you look closely, you can see it. So as far as other hosts are concerned, some people have said they found the nematode in clethra, but it's not clear that it has actually been able to um, undergo its life cycle completely. It might just be that in the process of hitchhiking on whatever variety of animals uh, it hitchhikes on, that it finds its way into a stomate of a clethra leaf and is able to set up housekeeping for a season, but not able to actually uh, overwinter in buds and then cause an outbreak. I mean, I've been in clethra swamps that were near heavily infested beech trees and not seen any symptoms on the on the clethra. So. Um, uh, I think that we will we'll stay focused on beech for now. Um, we've not seen any symptoms like it in maple or or birch or oak, so I think we're we're pretty confident that this is a disease of American beech and also European beech. Thank you. Very clear answer there. Um, question from Leah: Can landscape equipment be a vector for long distance transmission? And I'll just maybe add. Uh, Connor and an additional question about wood chips uh, from infected beech trees. Yeah. Is there any evidence of transmission from infected wood chips? Um, and same sort of question, should they be worrying about uh, chipping in the winter months and then yeah. using the <clears throat> processed mulch to spread over other people's properties? So um, it's important, you know, it's important to, I guess in general, to be careful with what you do with wood chips for lots of reasons um, that have nothing to do with this nematode. Um, so, you know, perhaps just sort of a a, a blanket a, a approach of caution is is called for in general. Um, if you're chipping uh, buds, branches with buds on them that could be infected, I suppose it's possible that an intact bud could make it through a chipper. Um, and you could definitely spread the nematode that way, I suppose, um, since the nematode survives in, the, none of this has been tested or, or experimented with, by the way. Again, it's just a matter of taking what we know so far about the biology of the nematode and then just applying it with some common sense. Um, so if, if buds make it through a chipper and those, those nematodes survive, then in the spring, when those those buds are not going to obviously they're you know they've, they've been taken off taken off their branches they're not going to flush leaves in that wood pile um, so the 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 trick for the nematodes that got caught in that bud in those buds would be to somehow get out of those buds and make it make their way on something and up into a canopy um, they would certainly not survive the process of maturation of a wood chip pile, which is in general is what you should do anyway, um, is is compost that, or at least mulch it for a year or two, age it before you go and spread it, go and spread it. 
I don't think the nematode would, sur would survive. One could, I suppose, do an experiment where you put uh, bags of, of buds inside of a wood pile, uh, a pile of wood chips, and then remove that a year later and see whether or not there are still viable nematodes or viable eggs. Um, but that, ex that research hasn't been done. Thank you, awesome. So many good questions to continue on with. We'll keep going. Um, from Matthew and Hallie, uh, asking for clarification about how large a single nematode is. Can or are the nematodes visible to the naked eye when they exit a leaf? Um, that's a good question. So they're they're just under a, a, a hundred um, uh, micrometers in length. Uh, maybe say between 50 and 75. Um, so one nematode, you'd have a hard time seeing it unless you had really good light and in a, and because they're somewhat trans, translucent, um, light goes through them. They have a keratin exoskeleton, um, but it's light goes right through it. Um, but if you say, if you had a mid to late season leaf with lots of nematodes in it and put that leaf in water, you'd see so many nematodes coming out that you would you would recognize the nematode by virtue of the numbers of them in that dish of water, especially if you have that dish of water sitting on a, a light source, light, a transilluminating light source, like coming from underneath that dish of water. So they are barely visible to the naked eye, but um, if you had just one, you probably wouldn't notice it. Um, but a hand lens is really all you need if you put that dish of water uh, on a, you know, let's say a light table of some kind, or just have some light coming from underneath, and then look at it with a hand lens um, or a loop, you would be able to see the nematode. You would see it with a hand lens. Thank you. Uh, Linda asks, what is causing the dark banding in the spring? Is that damage or a response by the leaf? Well, you answered your own question. Um, I don't mean to, to be facetious here, but uh, the dark banding is a response of the leaf to the nematode. It's not, it's, the dark banding is not the result of a, of a lot of nematodes blocking light, if that was maybe cons thought of as the one, one explanation. That is the physiological response of the leaf tissue to the feeding of the nematode only that occurs during uh, inside the bud. So those leaf primordia, those tiny little leaf primordia inside the bud are physiologically very different than a mature flushed out leaf. So when nematodes migrate from a symptomatic band in the summertime into another asymptomatic band of the same leaf or an asymptomatic leaf nearby, they can go in there, they will set up housekeeping, they will feed, they will reproduce, but you will not see dark banding form during the, that season. So it's during the period in the bud when they're feeding on those leaf primordia, um, releasing effector molecules that then induce the leaf tissue to change uh, the number of cells in the leaf primordium as it's developing also to change the types of cells and the shape of the cells. Um, that also argues for something like a very intimate relationship that has co-evolved between the nematode and phagus. It's pretty clear that this nematode did not co-evolve with this species of phagus um, because of the, extent of the extent of the damage, but clearly, the nematode has evolved a suite of effector molecules that allow it to both reproduce in beech and not in other host species. Um, so, so that very intimate relationship is the is another you know indication that it probably co-evolved with some other member of the phagaceae because it can only do that with um, phagus. And so those symptoms you're seeing are the result of damage done to primordia in the bud, uh, not, you're not going to see those symptoms form during the, during the season. 
Thank you. A question from Serena. In an area such as downstate New York, where pretty much every tree and sapling are infected, what type of monitoring do you recommend beyond the USDA survey? Uh, so you mean the U.S. Forest Survey uh, that's co-hosted by both Cleveland Metro Parks and the U.S. Forest Service, I'm assuming, um, using the, the phone app that they produced for that. Um, that's about it. Uh, there's really, um, you know, there's nothing else to report. You know, the most important reports now are those that come from sites which are becoming fewer and far farther between uh, those sites that don't have beach leaf, or beach leaf disease or are not currently reported to have it, um, so that that map can continue to to you know to um, fl fill out as it no doubt will um, across the range of of beach. Thank you. Um, another couple of questions about how. Are they spreading geographically, or what are the current theories? And is anyone studying uh, birds as possible vectors? Yes, birds are being looked at as possible vectors um, by uh, by one one of the ways that that's being done is um, birds are being uh, fed beach buds in bird feeders, um, and then those birds are misnetted and trapped and try to collect their poop to see whether or not the the um, the nematode can survive passage through the bird gut. Um, another way is uh, Dr. Carta went to Ohio f three years ago and collected various arthropods that tend to, like spider mites, for example, on beach foliage that was infected with beech leaf disease. And then they brought those those collected arthropods back to the lab and showed that you know there occasionally you'll find a nematode and it was hard to know if it was light beech leaf disease nematode or just any of the other uh, nematodes that free living nematodes that are found sometimes on the surface of leaves um, and they did find that nematodes at least in principle can attach themselves or just attach by virtue of their stickiness and their small and their size onto the onto the um, extremities of of these arthropods um, and it doesn't mean that it's one or the other it could be that any and all of these things squirrels moving up and down in trees birds flying from tree to tree just you know if it's a if it if there was a rain in the morning and a, a blue a, a blue jay flies into the canopy to go after a beech nut could easily pick up nematodes that exited leaves and they're sitting in a, there on that water film and they can live for hours and hours and hours on that water film and by the way these nematodes also seem to be able to undergo a process called anhydrobiosis meaning the ability to dry down completely and then revivify when when put back in water um, so uh, they're pretty robust little buggers and um, and it seems as though you know they could revivify in another wet event if they dry down on the outside of a leaf, um, and then get picked up by a bird in the in feathers, foliage, fur, something like that, um, and move around. Long distance dispersal. This is something we're still studying. I'm developing a DNA fingerprinting system so that we can track pathways of spread to see whether or not one one question that we ha will have with this marker system is to be able to determine whether or not this nematode was the result of a single introduction or several, and then also to be able to compare it doing similar sorts of work on the Japanese nematode in Japan to see what if, if we can sort of compare the population genetics to better understand how it spreads um, and also where it came from and what, what its native host is uh, in Japan, if that's where it, if that's where it's from. Thank you so much. And I can already tell we're going to run out of time to get to all these fabulous questions, but we still have a few more minutes, so I'll keep going. Um, oh, goodness, let me go all the way back up. Uh, let's see here. From Christopher, are there any <clears throat> studies being done as to the soil conditions between the plots that are infected and those showing no infection? 
right now, I don't know that we have any plots anymore that have no infection. Um, <laughs> we did a year or two ago. Um, and the only thing that soil conditions, you know, soil conditions alone will determine to some degree whether you're going to have a beach stand occurring there or not. Um, they're they're somewhat they have some some degree of plasticity in terms of tolerance for different types of soil, but not in, not entirely. Like in the northeast part of Connecticut, um, we don't find a lot of a lot of beach in those forests there, and we assume that that's because the soil is just not sweet enough uh, to support stands of beach. Um, but uh, that there's no no example yet, and Maine is kind of prove in this case so far, although Vermont would be an interesting case to study if it's just a matter of time or if there is something different about. Um, so that, that would be the one place would be Vermont and parts of New Hampshire where there are long-term plots where there still is no beech leaf disease, but um, there's so many variables that it's really hard to tease apart one and call and 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 identify that as causative rather than just co co a correlation. Thank you. I'm just going to say this verbally too. I have some folks asking for a review of some of the things you discussed live in your presentation today. I'm going to put a link in the chat to the website where you can find a recording of the presentation and watch the information again at a later date. Apologies, but I want to get some of the sort of new topic questions answered now. Um, let's see here. So Lori is asking, <clears throat> what is your recommended approach if we spot it in a residential landscape? Should it be reported any treatments available? And I'll combine that with another question about, um, do you have a contact for someone who is doing the latest research on management for landscape trees? Yes, and so that contact would be Dr. Richard Coles at the at our Valley Lab. He's one of several people, but also some of the commercial uh, concerns. Um, Bartlett, Davy, Rainbow, all are are looking into control strategies. There hasn't been a lot of federal funding for control. Um, in fact, there's been very little. Um, but there's been a lot of interest among uh, some of these uh, tree care companies in exploring uh, different methods of control. Um, and so that would be another approach to take. But Dr. Coles, C-O-W-L-E-S, um, has done quite a bit of work on uh, control of landscape trees. There's no need to report, unless you're in a county that is, is currently identified as not having beech leaf disease, um, that would be the only case in which you should report it. Um, I don't know where that would be, Vermont, New Hampshire, and, and so far uh, a few of the uh, currently, uh, the counties in Maine where it's currently uh, not, not known to occur, um, or Southern New Jersey, for example. Um, so uh, yeah, other, other than that, we're, we're, I, since 2020, I've been asking people not to, not to report um, since we've confirmed it in all, all of our counties, I, I, I don't need, in Connecticut, I, I really would rather not receive phone calls and emails with reports of beach leaf disease because we just know that it is pretty much everywhere and, and all the beaches, as far as we know, are, are susceptible. Thank you. Let me find the next question here. We'll do a couple more. Um... Oh, from Thomas. Most nurseries have stopped propagating, growing, and selling beech. Um, are you just suggesting maintaining our present trees in the landscape? Um, I'm not so sure if, if you mean American beech or European beech in the landscape. Um, so I, I don't have a recommendation really in that. I, I, I'm not. I'm not quite. I'm the. The question's not really clear to me um, what's what's being asked. Um, there are nurseries still selling European beech because our nursery inspectors have found beech leaf disease in some of them on nursery stock. Uh, so if someone wanted to plant a European beech, they could they could do that. Um, uh, 
based on based on circumstantial observations um one could plant japanese speech and feel somewhat confident that it's not a host but we don't know that for sure um it's just based on what was observed in the arboretum in in ohio um that's not the same thing as maintaining american beach uh congeners we've learned don't support the same ecosystem of of arthropods and birds that the native species in the same genus do so you're not you're not doing anything for the ecology of american beach by planting japanese beach you're just putting up japanese beach in your lawn or whatever thank you um let's see maybe one or two more questions uh one question about it does that has anyone looked at whether or not a mechanical management option such as pruning symptomatic branches uh it has any efficacy so no um people have talked about that but that's such an enormous experiment to do um <laughs> and it would take years um to determine whether or not there was any efficacy to doing it uh it's um yeah, I, that would be very, very hard. I mean, if you prune back a lot of the branches, you'd basically get no growth the next year. And we have speculated that in these areas where we've seen such widespread unfoliation in the understory, um, there presumably has been a population crash of the nematode, although we still see enough symptoms. And given that any one tree can produce a few leaves that can have tens of thousands of nematodes in them, you just need. Um, uh an occurrence of the right series of events which would be wet events and birds and rain splash and wind or whatever to redistribute that bottlenecked population um to explode again and start the disease all over again and that's one thing for people who are considering and engaging in a treatment regime for their landscape beaches even if it's american beach in a few acres that they have behind their house that given that the nematode is pretty much everywhere you're you're committing to an a a, 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 um, a treatment strategy annually for the long term there's um so that's just something to consider that if you're going to apply the foliar spray or do the soil drench or whatever else is turned up as a as a way to control beech leaf disease you're gonna to have to do it every year. There's no question about it. Um, otherwise, you'll just get a tree reinfected at some point. All right, I'm gonna combine one last set of questions and then I think that's it so we can take some time for the break. And you've been more than generous and awesome in answering these, but um, Normand asks, what role do the trees themselves uh, and their natural defense systems play with beech leaf disease and then another question um was do we know about any sort of natural enemies diseases parasites that impact the the nematodes populations we don't um nematodes um are an enormous group of organisms they're an entire phylum unto themselves um as genetically or as as biologically diverse as the phylum to which we belong which includes little tunicates um brainless spiny fish and humans that's a phylum chordata and the phylum nematoda is just as diverse um nematodes host a fairly large gut microbiome that seems to be an essential part of their ability to just live um so whether or not uh one management strategy might involve um, producing antibiotics that attack the gut microbiome. There seems to be nothing in beaches that 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 prevent them from um, really, uh, you know, ruining really basically ruining their own their own uh, ability to cycle because they, you know, they they produce such a large number of nematodes in such a short period of time that they destroy leaf tissue and end up as we've seen this year in so many aborted buds that their host they pretty much destroyed their host um 
the question is, is are they so strongly an R selected organism, meaning selected to just produce a lot of individuals and you only need a few to survive in order to maintain the population, um, that it doesn't matter that they're killing some of their hosts because there's always going to be more hosts available. Um, so we we haven't had enough time with this disease to know if there are uh, genotypes of American beech in the forest that uh, might be more resistant uh, to the ability of the nematode to cause damage in the buds. It's all about the buds. Everything about this nematode depends on overwintering in the buds. That's clear. Um, so there may be genetic resistance in Native American beech, um, but it's going to take time to determine that. There certainly is some genetic resistance in, in American beech to beech bark disease, to the scale feeding um, that, that initiates the, the disease complex known as beech bark disease. Um, so that's all going to take time, and, and not just time, by the way. Um, I'm seeing dollar signs. It's going to take funding, uh, and and we're we're working really hard on trying to get enough funding to do the kinds of research that everybody's wanting to have done. But you know, there's a lot of other things that are demanding research funding as well. So um, we're doing the best that we can with what we have. Dr. Mara, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic presentation and again for being so generous with your time and answering all of these excellent audience questions. We've got a lot of feedback, folks saying fantastic, this was so interesting, so thank you okay. <laughs> very much. Again, we really appreciate you being here with us today. You're very welcome and I wish everybody to have a, a good day. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to continue putting some different things in the chat that folks have been asking about. I have uh, folks up in Maine asking people, if you're living or working in Maine, to report beech leaf disease that you might be seeing uh, to a specific location. I'll also put some reporting stuff for Massachusetts. Oh, There are other states as I can find it in there. Okay, thank you everyone. We're back from the break and it's my pleasure to introduce to everybody our second speaker. Nicole Kelleher is the director of the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation's Forest Health Program and she'll be talking to us today about invasive forest insects in Massachusetts. I just want to take one quick moment. I think Dr. Mara mentioned it this morning, but if it wasn't explicitly stated, I think it was, nematodes are not insects. <laughs> so we snuck that one in to the invasive insect webinar series here, but clearly the information was much needed. And Nicole, one question, not, not to put you on the spot if you're not talking about um, beech leaf disease, but there was a question that came in specific to mass wondering how did it get on to Martha's Vineyard? Do we have any um, uh, sort of ideas about how it hopped onto the island? But feel free to address that if you approach that topic in your talk or not at all. So I don't want to take away from your time. I'll let you get started. All right. Thank you, Tani. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today. I have, I think this is the fourth year I've been doing this program with you guys and I love getting the chance to talk about what my program does and a lot of the work we're really interested in. Um, and as Sonny just mentioned, nematodes, not truly an insect. Uh, I will mention them as well. Uh, also what people consider invasive, also the lines can get a little bit blurry there too, but for the purposes of how I approach it and kind of what I talk about in outreach like this, I consider um, an invasive insect is an in-state insect that did historically not belong in this range. So sometimes they are non-native, um, sometimes they are just from a range in the United States outside of this area, and they are an insect that is causing um, detectable harm to our trees and forests. So sometimes we have a lot of non-native uh, species out in our forests that are pretty benign, um, they do feed, they do damage, but they function a lot more in a way that our native insects and pests do 
uh, where we're not seeing these huge outbreak events, we're not seeing a significant loss in our trees, we're not seeing uh, a significant change to our forest from these invasive species. So just because something's not native, it doesn't always mean it's bad. Also sometimes because something is native doesn't mean it's gonna behave itself either. Uh, another caveat before we kind of get into this is, uh, I, I am the forest health director here in Massachusetts. So the work my, my team and I do work is within Massachusetts and a lot of the, the direct information and maps and stuff I'm gonna show are gonna be Massachusetts centric, but bugs don't follow geographic boundaries. So a lot of what we work on here and see is really common throughout our region in the northeast and we work on a lot of regional projects with our neighboring states and collaborate on a lot of these different activities and share information so if you are from outside massachusetts feel free to ask questions at the end i might know the answers or i might be able to at least send you in the right direction to someone that does so my forest health program, we work on all sorts of insect disease, disturbance events, uh, and kind of addressing, identifying what's going on here in our forest and what we can actually do to make a change and improve the conditions. So we utilize a lot of different tools to detect and monitor um, these insects and diseases out there. Uh, we have long-term monitoring plots, we utilize treatment programs, biocontrol releases, and other mitigation actions to help us control and minimize the impact from these invasive species. So we focus a lot, a lot of our work does end up being done in our, our DCR owned and other state forests. Uh, but once again, insects don't know boundaries. So we do work with other landowners, nonprofits, other public lands. Uh, we go out and work with land, private property owners as well to identify some of these concerns. So um, I have a, a small team. Uh, there's only five of us that do most of the bulk of this work. Um, but if you see us out when in the forest, we usually are wandering around with binoculars, looking at our clipboards and phones, uh, carrying around weird contraptions that we're using to trap. Uh, always feel free to say hi, ask us what we're doing. Uh, we, we always love to talk about insects and other weird things and trees. Um, and so we do a lot of these different projects, but one of the big ones we do every year that kind of helps guide what we do over the course of the year and, and really give us some good hard data uh, is our aerial survey. So myself and one of the other foresters get up in a tiny little Cessna plane uh, and fly grid lines across the entire state and map everything we see that looks unusual. So sometimes from the air, we can say like, oh, we know that's definitely defoliation, or we can just say like the coloration on those trees uh, look kind of weird or something looks off in that area, or it looks like there's a pocket of dead trees over there. So we map absolutely everything that we see, and then we get out on the ground and actually investigate those points and make a final determination of what the damage we actually saw is and what caused it. So from year to year, there can be big differences in, in what we're seeing, the amount of acreage we see across the state and what drives it. Uh, this last year in 2020, the biggest by far was spongy moth causing a significant amount of defoliation in Western Mass. Saw a lot of white pine needle damage, uh, seeing a lot of ash mortality at this point. So it helps us kind of figure out what are the big picture items, um, maybe capture some things we might not be seeing out and about in our usual work and projects. Uh, and guide some of the, the, the funding we seek, the projects we work on in the upcoming year. So this map, uh, really hard to see some of these little these little points there, but I believe Tani already shared the link for this story map in the chat. But our forest health story map is a great resource. It has our up-to-date maps throughout the, the growing season and our, our field season, and it has our aerial survey map. So it's interactive. You can zoom in and out, look around, click on things, and see what what the different colors actually mean. So we keep our last two years of data up on this story map. So uh, feel free to check it out. We also have a lot of great pictures of the other types of insects and diseases we're seeing and information um, and good contact information for us out there. And if you are looking for aerial survey data, um, Beyond the last two years, the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative hosts a regional forest health atlas. So this is all of our historic aerial survey data um, for New England in one place. So any, any of the 
the other New England and New York states, um, their historic data is housed there as well. You can filter by state, year, specific damage agents and pests. Um, so it's a really cool tool. It's nice just to look in an area if you're kind of concerned or just for fun to kind of see what historically has gone on and kind of help shape some of the forests around you. So jumping into some of the, the projects we work on, um, this last year here in Massachusetts, we were able to be part of the Early Detection Rapid Response Program. So this is a US Forest Service funded national program. So uh, each year, multiple states uh, in the United States participate in it. It kind of rotates on a cycle. So some bigger or higher risk states do trap more frequently. Some of our smaller, less risk states um, cycle through every like three to five years will participate in this. So we identify high risk introduction locations in our state. So pathways where pests could be introduced to the United States or introduced to our state. So areas where we're seeing a lot of uh, commerce and movement and transportation corridors. And near those corridors, we identify forested areas. So areas that have trees and forests um, that if a pest was introduced and some of these high risk points could easily travel to these forested areas and start to establish. So we use these black funnel traps to look for bark beetles that could have been introduced. Um, at each site, we use a set of three traps. So one is has a lure that helps attract uh, bark beetles that would be in hardwood trees. One has a generic conifer lure and one has a more spruce specific lure. Uh, so we hang them up in the trees. Uh, I force my team to pose for pictures for me all the time to share during presentations like this. Uh, and we come back every two weeks and collect the samples in the cup. So at the bottom, uh, there's we use some like RV antifreeze to help protect those samples a little bit, filter them, um, and send them off to the Forest Service identifier that actually goes through all our samples and lets us know what they actually found in there. So this last year, uh, we had 12 sites. Each site had three traps. So it's total of 36 traps set between April through July, and a total of 69 unique bark beetle species were actually identified during that, and 13 of those were first detections in Massachusetts. So those were bark beetle species that um, were not native to Massachusetts and were found here for the first time, and all of those were ones of really limited concern. They have been found in either neighboring states or had been unofficially and not um, documented here in Massachusetts before, things that didn't really cause a lot of significant damage. Bark beetles usually are secondary pests, so they come in and attack trees that are already declining, already kind of on their way out, and they kind of are part of that decline and decomposition process and are usually not directly harmful to our living trees. Um, but one interesting thing that was found was a one new to North America detectus detection. So it is this longhorn beetle shown here, the Malorcus minor. It is native to Europe where it is commonly found in declining spruce trees. So we found it in a site where our trap was hung in a Norway spruce. Um, after going out and doing further investigations around the, that site, um, some samples were taken back to the U.S. Forest Service facility um, to rear out in rearing barrels and see if we could get some more to emerge. But it seems it is not causing any direct harm to any of our spruce and our trees, but is just present in declining branches that just naturally are happening in, in these Norway spruce. So exciting to find something new. Um, good news that is not something that is of major concern or regulation, just, just something that we didn't see here before in Massachusetts. And that's why projects like this are really useful because it helps us find something early. And the earlier we are able to detect something that is non-native and can be invasive and damaging to our trees, um, the more time we have to develop a response and maybe eradicate it from our forest and minimize the long-term impact. So after listening to Dr. Mara's uh, presentation, I know you all are experts now on peach leaf disease, but I just wanted to mention a little bit what we're seeing here in Massachusetts. Um, much like Connecticut, it is very highly advanced. Um, we had 11 monitoring sites as part of the regional project here in Massachusetts. Uh, and when I first set them up in 2020, I was like, oh, we'll have two infected and then um, nine uninfected. And over time, we'll get up to half 
um, by this last year, 10 out of 11 of the sites were already infected with beech leaf disease. So it has progressed really rapidly, uh, moved really quickly. And these are all of the towns we've detected here in Massachusetts. So um, I know Dr. Mara doesn't want to get reports, um, but I still am really interested in getting reports from the public in communities we haven't detected it. So kind of mapping where we're seeing it. Um, my team is really interested in seeing the variation of, of symptoms we're kind of seeing out there on the landscape. So if you are in one of the communities on this map that are still white and you see symptoms this year, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll on our, on our story map, there's a beach leaf disease link that we have a live map that we update throughout the season as we confirm new communities. And there's going to be a link in that story map that is directly to a reporting form where you can put in your information about uh, the report you have, add any pictures, location data, um, and it'll come right to us and we can go out and either confirm it or say, oh, this isn't beach leaf disease yet. Um, so just good news. but. In the last year, we had over 70 new towns. Um, we found it in every county in Massachusetts. So it is moving really quickly. And I don't know how it got to Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Uh, other, there, other pests and things sometimes take time to, to jump across the wa water there. Um, it's, I think it is likely being spread by birds just at the pattern that we're seeing it. Um, will be like at a campground and around the campground, we don't see any signs of beech leaf disease, but we'll be hiking two, two plus miles on a trail and get to a remote part of the forest and see symptoms out there. So it doesn't follow our usual human assisted movement that we commonly see with new diseases. Um, that doesn't mean humans aren't aiding in the moving and spreading it around, but I think the primary vector is probably something like birds or wind or other conditions that are kind of outside of our control. Uh, Martha's Vineyard and then Gosnold Island down there have actually really significant beach forests that are a really large component of, of their forests out in these unique island habitats. And it is quite, quite devastating to see how quickly it has spread through those kind of areas out there. Um, and we're seeing it progress really rapidly. Even sites that we first identified in 2020 were already seeing um, a lot of really withered curled leaves coming out. We're seeing areas that are having over 90% of the buds are aborted um, and just these secondary flush leaves coming out in, in a little bit later in June. So we are concerned about the long-term impacts. Um, we're definitely working with other states and partners to, to kind of figure out what, what this is going to mean long-term. And I do just want to give uh, my voice of concern about some of these treatments that are out there. Um, as Dr. Mara was saying, research takes a long time. It takes years kind of to, to do a field-based treatment, see the results and kind of prove that that is actually what is happening or what is being impacted. And so I, I get calls from homeowners that are really desperate and want to protect their trees. Uh, and they have these companies coming with these like secret botanical blends that they're gonna spray on their trees and save them. And it's, there's a lot of things that probably aren't going to help your trees. And some of them might not harm your trees. Some things might not be great to be putting in your ecosystem and landscape out there. So be wary when you're being approached and kind of uh, approaching some of these new, new diseases and insects um, and the treatments you're choosing to put out on the landscape. I know I got called from one company that was like, oh, I can't, I can't tell you what I'm doing, but I know it's working because after I sprayed it, uh, in June, all of a sudden new leaves came out and they had no symptoms. So it was someone that didn't really understand the biology of this nematode, um, doesn't, doesn't know that you're only seeing symptoms that initially come out in the spring and leaves that reflush later won't show them um, and are kind of just making assumptions, going on a roll and not being the best stewards of our landscape in that regard. So um, if, if my team finds out more information about Trials that that are doing well will definitely share that information. But at this time, I I don't I don't support specifically any of those, and I get asked that question a lot. Um, so our our beach here in Massachusetts also have beach bark disease complex, which had been first introduced in the 1930s, um, and then through the late uh, 20th century, we saw a huge amount of loss of our American beach and a real shift in our American beach forest due to this. 
Um, we still have beech trees. We still have the, their usefulness in their habitat in our forests. They still provide a food source for our wildlife, but beech bark disease had already really challenged our trees. So it is also another invasive species. So the beech scale will come in, attack the trunk of a tree, um, use its little sucking mouth parts to, to feed. And when it, it feeds, it causes damage that allows funguses to actually get in and start causing these cankers. So there's two primary Nectria canker funguses that get introduced. Um, you'll kind of see in the, in the early summer, you'll see this red area around trees where you'll see the fruiting spores of those funguses. Um, and then over time, cankers develop. And usually when you first start to see the cankers, they're like around the size of like a quarter. But as they kind of can spread, you get more and more cankers. It can be really damaging to your trees until the trees basically girdled from these cankers. And you see a lot of decline. You'll start to see branches and canopy die back. Um, and sometimes just one right in the middle of summer, all the leaves will turn brown and your beach will actually just not be able to overcome the disease anymore. So it's really common. Uh, it's very rare to see an American beach that doesn't have at least some, some of these cankers. And the population can really wane from year to year depending on the abundance of the scale insect that's out there, um, if the conditions are favorable for the fungus to get in and infect. So we'll see stands that have, that have beach bark disease for decades and sometimes trees will die, sometimes they'll just kind of struggle along for a while. But it is really common and how this interacts with beech leaf disease is going to be really interesting and see how um, the two are kind of going to com compete uh, and long-term impacts to our trees because of this. Um, last year, I also got a huge amount of calls in the, in the late summer, early fall um, about beech blight aphids. So these are common on the twigs and branches of, of American beech. It's a native insect. They just aggregate in really huge numbers. They're also called the boogie woogie aphids because they just kind of all dance around on the twigs together. Uh, and they're not that harmful to trees. They go through these cycles where we'll have like really big population increases and you'll notice huge amounts of these fuzzy white guys all over the twigs of your beach. Uh, the, really the, the thing that's the worst about them is they uh, secrete honeydew, which then you can have a lot of sooty mold under on the ground underneath your trees. So I was getting reports of like, under my beech trees, it's all black. It's, I think my tree's dying. So it is, it looks really alarming. It's, they're, I think they're kind of cool, but it's usually not a long-term harm to your trees. It's just uh, a big population buildup in the late season. And usually by the next year, the population's kind of back down. You might see a couple, but won't see the same large numbers again. One of the other big projects my team works on, and one of the things that's kind of been keeping me up at light, night lately is Southern Pine Beetle. So this is a small bark beetle that is native to the Southern United States, uh, but has been spreading northward in the past few decades. So historically, it was very common in mid-Atlantic and South, even into Mexico and Central America. It, it feeds on a, a wide variety of different pine species. Uh, it really impacts like loblolly plantations down in the southern United States, where it aggregates in huge, huge numbers and overwhelms trees and can kill stands of trees really, really rapidly. So it is a tiny little bark beetle. It looks impressive, impressive up there in that picture, but they're actually, they're smaller than a grain of rice. They're like the size of a quinoa. They are, are really tiny bark beetles. Um, and usually, as I said before, a lot of bark beetles just go after declining and dead trees and are kind of just part of that declining and decomposition process. But southern pine beetle is different because it will attack healthy trees. So they will, um, uh, in the spring, they kind of do their larger dispersal flights. Uh, southern pine beetle will land on its uh, preferred host. It'll send out pheromones that will cause other southern pine beetles to aggregate to that tree. The tree that is being attacked also puts out chemicals that brings more southern pine beetles in. So a single tree can get attacked by over a thousand southern pine beetles. So they're able to quickly overcome its defenses. They burrow just under the bark and create tunnels where they lay their eggs and their larvae will develop. Uh, and they can have multiple generations per year. 
So in the southern United States, where they have these long growing seasons, they have warm, favorable conditions, they don't have a lot of winter dieback, they can get like up to eight generations. So they, those thousand beetles go in, lay eggs, thousands more come out, they'll spread to the adjacent trees. So within a growing season, you can have a single infested tree spread to tens and tens of acres of trees that die um, just from this, this very small insect. So here in Massachusetts, um, the preferred hosts are pitch pine. So most of our pitch pine are out in our, our southeast and our coastal areas. We do have some inland stands that are, are kind of more unique uh, pine beef habitats. Uh, some of our more western mountain slopes will actually have some of these more dwarf shrubbier type pitch pine, um, you'll see like along dunes and in beach areas, these smaller pitch pine as well. So it's more common to see it out in, in Eastern Massachusetts, but you can find it throughout our state and all of those stands are at risk of this. And so usually um, our winter temperatures can kind of help keep the population down, our growing season's a little bit shorter. So up here, we probably get two, maybe three generations, but as our climate warms, as our winters are warmer, as our summers are warmer, as our growing season starts earlier and, and later, it kind of allows insects like this to expand their range, um, have more generations per year. So this had been a major issue historically in the mid-Atlantic and southern United States. In the early 2000s, they started seeing significant outbreaks in, Long I uh, in New Jersey. Um, then in 2014, they had very large outbreaks in Long Island, um, where they've seen huge amount of impact, loss of huge stands. I think they currently have about 5,000 standing infested trees that they are trying to fight against. Um, so in those areas, when they started seeing this outbreak are, are years where they had better conditions. They got up to like four generations per year. So here in Massachusetts, we're right on that edge. And as we get these years where it's a little bit warmer, we are also getting to be at risk for an outbreak event. We have caught southern pine beetle in traps since 2015. So um, following the outbreak in Long Island, um, us as well as some other neighboring states began trapping and looking for it here in our forest. And we did find it. We found it in multiple locations throughout the state. Um, we consistently catch it in our traps every year. But usually we'd find it in like one to three of our traps, we'd find very few beetles. Like the most we had ever caught was eight. It was really common to just find one or two single adult beetles in those traps. But this year we saw an increased, an elevated level of trap catch. So we set 24 traps uh, throughout the state, most of it concentrated in that, that Southeast corridor that is more common to have pitch pine. And we found it in 19 of our 24 sites. So more sites than we've ever found it in a single year. And the numbers we were catching were a lot more. So we, we found it about 150 in one of our sites, which is, is a, it's a big increase. So it's not uh, that, that crazy yet. It doesn't mean like we're having an outbreak event, like when they have their outbreaks in Long Island or the, the catch, they are, they're getting before an outbreak is usually over a thousand beetles. So it, it is a higher number than we've been seeing, but it's not at that critical level at this point, but we are concerned that we are starting to reach that threshold where it's more likely we will see an infestation. This year, we also found Southern pine beetle in a tree for the first time. So two trees that were in close proximity to one of our traps, um, we noticed these pitch tubes on it. So uh, it's really common to see pitch tubes on an, an, an infested tree. The bark beetle will go in, the tree does not want them in there, so they push pitch to try to get that beetle back out again. Uh, and since the, the holes for southern pine beetle are really small, the, the pitch doesn't really run. It kind of just globs up right at that point. And it looks like popcorn or like you took gum out of your mouth and just stuck it on the tree. So each tree we saw about had about 10 of these, these noticeable pitch tubes. And when we actually took a sample of that pitch, those pitch tubes, we found one that had a beetle stuck in the pitch and um, wasn't able to get past the tree's defenses. And we were able to confirm that it was a southern pine beetle. So out of an abundance of caution, uh, we don't want to have an outbreak event. We want to minimize the number of infested trees we see. We did 
destroy both of those trees this past fall. So we just cut the trees down, sent both of them through a chipper. Um, since it was a low number number of pitch tubes and we did find the, the beetles actively stuck in the pitch, it was unlikely that there was a lot of a population within those trees. But we, since we do want to be proactive, we do want to reduce our risk for an outbreak, um, we took really aggressive steps to kind of minimize that risk going into this next growing season. But we, we do have concerns. We're going to be trapping more this upcoming year. So we're going to be trapping in the spring, which we have typically done, but also adding in a fall trapping. We've been doing ground surveys around positive traps this last winter to ensure we're not missing any potentially infested trees around there that are drawing the beetles in. Um, but it is really about being uh, proactive and and taking steps when we kind of need to and it it can be hard sometimes for I know a lot of you on here are you work in the industry you understand the need sometimes to cut a tree but for the general public it can be hard to see um, trees being cut to save other trees so when you have a southern pine beetle infested tree such as the two we found we did want to cut those trees down and if you did find a pocket of infested trees you want to cut and remove those trees and then cut a buffer around them to help minimize the spread. So we are preparing for potential actions like that. There is also steps you can take before that to increase the resiliency in your pitch pine stands. So if your stands are healthy, they're going to be able to better fight against, against this pest. So some, some actions that have been taken in the South historically are, are like thinning your stands out. A lot of our pitch pine stands here in Massachusetts are incredibly overcrowded and really dense. Um, so the pictures here are from Mass Wildlife Properties where they manage their stands for wildlife, but a lot of the actions they took are really common of uh, preventative steps you can take to increase your resiliency. So things like mechanical thinning, um, introducing regular fire regimes onto your landscape um, and actions like that can help prevent the impacts of southern pine beetle even if it is present here in the landscape. So this is going to bring us into our first poll question, which is, which is southern pine beetle's preferred host tree in Massachusetts? A, pitch pine, B, white pine, C, red oak, or D, Norway spruce? We'll keep this poll open another 10 seconds. And the poll is closed. So the responses were 86% pitch pine, 11% white pine, 1% red oak, and 2% Norway spruce. Thanks, Alan. All right. Yep. So it is in the title, pine beetle. It it can get into some of our other pines, um, but it usually will only infest those if it's adjacent to like a super dense hotspot outbreak population. It's not going to go after white pine on its own. Um, it, it really does prefer pitch pine and, and will go after that. So kind of jumping from two of our, our newest threats and concerns to one of our oldest forest health issues and invasive insects we have, which is spongy moth, the Lymantria dispar caterpillar. So for those of you that hadn't heard, uh, it had a recent name change. So the Entomological Society of America, um, which 
deals with common names for insects here in the United States, um, had a vote, changed the name to spongy moth. So formerly known as gypsy moth, uh, scientific name, Lymantria dispar, but it is now commonly known as spongy moth. It is still the same insect, still causing the same damage that we've always seen out there defoliating our forests um, and feeding on our hardwood trees. So huge, uh, wide hosts of what it can eat, but it really does prefer our oak trees. So historic management, uh, things like spraying DDT out of airplanes and painting arsenic and creosote onto egg masses, we really have step back and have a really different approach to spongy moth now um, and rely on kind of the natural processes and natural controls. So it has been a part of our forest for over 150 years and has become somewhat naturalized. So it has um, processes and controls that kind of keep it in, in check, which are things like our own native, things like our mice will eat the egg masses, um, the Entomophagum omega, the very host specific fungus that infects the caterpillars, uh, the NPV viruses that go through their populations. So we don't take these dramatic steps anymore, though we do, do still see outbreak events. So historically we saw these population influxes um, and population dramatic collapses. And we see that really low period between the, the 50s to, through 60s and a lot of that is because they were doing a lot of treatments and things like DDT. Um, when I re read the historic reports from my program, it's like, we did such a good job. We sprayed so much DDT. We killed all the caterpillars. Uh, and they did. They did knock back the, the spongy moth populations, but it also caused a lot of significant harm to other organisms in our ecosystem. And when we stopped using those products, we had a huge backlash and kind of saw dramatic population increases in the early 80s. But by the late 80s, we saw Entomophica established across the landscape, and that really kept our populations in control for quite a number of years until we saw the large outbreak event from 2015 to 2019 in central and eastern Massachusetts. So in recent years, we've been, we've been seeing a lot of spongy moth. Uh, it is definitely out there in our landscape. It's been causing a lot of issues. We saw devastating oak mortality in central and eastern mass in, in that 2017, 2018, 2019 time. And now we're starting to see a significant amount of defoliation out in Berkshire and Franklin counties. So even historically, we didn't see quite as much spongy moth activity and defoliation out in, in, East, in Berkshires and, and far western Massachusetts. So it's an area that it, it had been present there since the 1920s. It, it was out for over 100 years in those areas, but didn't see the population build up. We saw quite as frequently in central and eastern Massachusetts. And the dry conditions that kind of limited entomophaga and limited its ability to infect the population critically impacted those areas. And also, since they historically had smaller caterpillar populations, there just wasn't as much entomophaga in the landscape. So. Entomophaga, it needs a caterpillar to reproduce. So if there's not a lot of caterpillars, it's not making a lot of spores. It's not present out in the landscape as much. So once conditions allowed, the populations start creeping up, we're starting to see significant defoliation out there. Um, last spring, I was, I was really excited because oaks were leafing out kind of late and the caterpillars had already started hatching. So I was like, this is great. They're all gonna starve to get to death, but they just jumped onto things like beech, birch, willows, um, whatever they could until the, the oaks started to pop. And as soon as oak leaves were out, they just climbed up those oaks and started feeding. So we did see a lot of uh, impact in, in our hardwoods out there. But out in, in the Berkshires and in Franklin counties, and then in the hill towns in Eastern Hamden and Hampshire counties, we're not seeing it quite as widespread. It does seem to stay more localized in the areas that are more oak dense. So our forests out there, there are areas that are more maple dominated um, and the oak, oaks are kind of limited to certain hill slopes and the spongy moth does seem to be staying isolated to kind of those areas. Um, my team just completed our winter egg mass survey. So we utilize uh, random point selection to go out and survey and do counts of egg masses 
And the ones that are like orange and red are areas that it's, it's very likely we'll see noticeable defoliation again this year. Those are higher risk points. Um, so we are seeing throughout the same area we saw last year, we're expecting it um, building a little bit more in Hamden and Hampshire County than we saw last year. And while we do, don't expect significant defoliation in central and eastern Massachusetts, uh, we are still finding egg masses. So when we're out doing these counts, um, a lot of the areas that, that we surveyed in, in central and eastern Mass are areas that are, are higher risk. So they're areas where we have repeatedly seen defoliation. And when we see population build up, build up to kind of start in those areas. So we were seeing, we're seeing egg masses. We're seeing some out there. It's not like we found no spongy moth, but we'd see like three, five egg masses in a plot instead of the 200 we're seeing out in Berkshire County. So it, it is still present out there. And if conditions are favorable, we could see some areas of really localized defoliation um, throughout Central and Eastern Mass too, but we're, we're projecting it mostly for, for Western Mass seeing the impact from it this year. Um, but with the drought that we saw last year, it also stresses our trees out and if we do have another year of significant defoliation, we may start to see some oak mortality again in our state. And uh, a lot of this is driven by, so our climate is changing. Uh, we're seeing changes in our precipitation pattern. So not the total amount of precipitation we receive, but kind of how we receive it and changing those spring precipitation, um, negative impacts, how entomophagus is able to infect the caterpillars, which is why we're seeing more of a buildup now. So long-term, we may see changes to how the Lymantria population does, does change due to our, our climate changing and changes to our precipitation patterns. Another common pest we're seeing um, and has been pretty impactful the last couple of years is hemlock willia delgid. So it is not new to Massachusetts. It has been here since the late 80s. It blew up the Connecticut River corridor on a, a hurricane and then rapidly spread throughout the state. So it's been identified in all of our counties, um, commonly see it in pretty much every hemlock scan we go to. And over the past three decades, we've, we've lost trees to it, but we've had some sites that have been infected on and off since then. Um, trees decline but not seeing huge amounts of mortality. Uh, they are very easy to notice under the, on, on the underside of needles. They're nice and wooly, uh, especially around this time of year, you'll, you'll notice a lot of the wool um, and kind of underneath that, they are a little, basically a big blob with tiny little legs hanging off of it and their face jammed right into the base of the needle where they're feeding. Uh, and they, they're feeding, um, since there are so many of them on, on a needle, on a branch, they can be really, even though they're so small, can be really impactful. So they are a bivoltine parthenogenic population, which means they are an all-female population that are able to reproduce asexually, and they have two generations per year. So we can see populations really build up really dramatically. Uh, spread really dramatically just because you only need a single uh, a single hem hemlock willia adelgid to get to a site for it to be able to establish and reproduce. The one good thing we have going for us here in Massachusetts is our winter temperatures can really negatively impact the population. So they are not super cold hardy and they don't love dramatic temperature changes. So they can they can actually withstand temperatures down into the negative tens and teens, but the way they reach that temperature is indicative of how well they can survive it. So if it is slowly and steadily decreasing temperatures until it gets there, they have a better likelihood of surviving those low temperatures. But when we have these dramatic temperature swings that we see really commonly here in Massachusetts, those can be really lethal to their population. Um, so usually in the winter, uh, a really common, we'll see about 60 to 70% of the adelgid population will die off due to our winter temperatures. So uh, the last two years, so 2020, 2021, 
we had really mild winters. And when it's like 40 degrees, Adelgid are so happy. That's like the temperatures they thrive in. They don't like the summer. They are actually in a resting phase all summer because they don't like the heat. And then when fall hits, that's when they start getting active. They start moving into their, their next life cycle. They start developing to adults, start feeding. And they actually lay their eggs around this time in late February. So when it's a mild winter here and it's like 30 to 45 degrees, they are thriving. So um, the last few years, we saw a really significant buildup in our populations because we had mild winters and didn't get the knockback in the population we usually see. So my team in the last week have been out collecting samples, doing counts, squishing bugs to see who is alive. And that crazy, windy, cold weather blast that blew in about two weeks ago had a really significant impact on the Delgid. So they did not like that dramatic temperature swing and we saw a lot of mortality from that. So we, across the different sites, um, we're seeing about 80% of the Adelgid died very recently from that temperature swing, which is very good news to hear. Um, but this is just kind of a general of what their, their population is. So they have two populations, uh, two generations here, the cystins and the progridians. And uh, the cystin generation is kind of the one where we see the biggest population flux. So they are laid as eggs in um, like May. They hatch in early summer and they're uh, a nymph stage called the crawler. So they kind of just settle on the branches at that point and rest. So they're in this kind of resting estivation stage throughout the summer. And when we have really hot, dry summers like we had last year, we do see some mortality in the population during that time. They don't, they don't love a summer, they don't like getting too hot, they don't like getting too dry. So we did see some, some a good amount die off during our, our dry summer we saw last year. Um, then once the fall comes, it starts to cool down, they start getting a little bit more active, start feeding more, start developing, and they lay their eggs in a late winter. Those eggs um, hatch in like March-ish, and it's a really short generation. The Pagridian generation is really short. So it's only from March, they develop really quickly, develop by May, and by May they're mature adults that lay eggs. So even when we do have a lot of that mortality at that late winter stage, um, they have another generation right in the spring so they can rebound really quickly during that. We have uh, released biocontrols for Hemlock William Delgid here in Massachusetts. So we've historically released two species, Laracobius nigrinus and Saskagis kimnasugi. So Saskagis kimnas was released in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, Laracobius had been released since the late aughts, uh, early 20 teens. Um, through, through now, it is a species we still release. And both of these are predator beetles. So they are beetles that actively eat the Adelgid. And we have not had great success getting them to establish. And part of this is because our winter temperatures fluctuate and our populations of adelgid are not consistent and these beetles need a consistent food source for their populations to be able to survive. Um, there's also thought that they might themselves might not survive our winters very well. So we've released, um, these are all the sites in Massachusetts where, where they've been released over the years. Uh, we go back and try to recover, but we've had very limited success recovering these beetles. But last year in 2020, two new biocontrol species were released. Um, Leucotaraxix, which is a predator fly species. Um, so there's two different species with that. And Laracobius osicensis, which is closely related to Laracobius nigrinus, but um, is from a, uh, it's from Japan and has a little bit more different landscape that it's, it's used to um, and maybe better suited for our landscape here. So the Leucotaraxis species are, um, they're released by researchers with UMass um, in Joe Elkington's lab and they are reared at Cornell at their facility. And the timing that these, these flies feed is a little bit different than the beetles feed. So the hope is that um, combined together by having these multiple species out on the landscape, we can get more to survive, more to be able to feed on the adelgid. Um, and possibly since the, the flies are active in a different time of year, they might be a little bit better suited to our climate um, and kind of provide us more of a long-term control. 
states in like the mid Atlantic and southern states have much better success with the, the biocontrols. They have them established, naturally spread, um, naturally kind of keep the population down a bit. So we're hoping to be able to keep doing this type of work, keep trying to recover, um, doing research at our sites, and hopefully improve our long term goals of having these biocontrols established. All right, so poll question number two. How many generations per year does hemlock woolly adulgid have? A, one, B, two, C, three, or D, four? We'll give people about 10 more seconds to reply. Don't forget that you have to click on submit after you've answered the question for it to be recorded. Okay, this poll is closed. And let's see, 8% uh, said one generation 81 percent said two six percent said three and five percent said four thank you alan all right so yes they have two generations per year which kind of increases the pressure that we receive from hemophilia delgid and kind of increases their ability to cause decline and mortality in our trees uh, here in Massachusetts, we also have a elongate hemlock scale really commonly in the same area. So this is also an introduced um, species. It's, uh, you'll see it on the underside of needles and it's a flat armored scale. And unlike hemlock willia delgid, it's a little bit more, uh, it can kind of fight off our winters a little bit better, a little bit more protected against that and a little bit more persistent. So once a stand is infected, we typically see it to just keep keep having uh, the scale population increase compared to sites that get infested by adelgid, we might come back one year and not see any. Um, so the stands and areas where our hemlocks are declining the most rapidly are where we have hemlock woolly adelgid and we do have the scale as well. Um, on its own, the scale doesn't cause quite a significant decline as the hemlock woolly adelgid. You'll see mostly a lot of um, yellowing and discoloration of needles. Uh, the needles are just not as productive photosynthesizing then it's taking resources from the scales, pulling resources from the needles as well. So basically it is just another, another stressor on our trees. So when we choose to treat in our state parks, um, we do treat against both hemlock woolly adelgid and elongate hemlock scale. So we use a dinotaphron based products uh, and we kind of target places in our, our state parks that are um, really culturally and ecologically significant. So going after some of our old growth stands, um, some of our really historic parks and uh, really valuable points where we have really dense hemlock forest protecting like stream reservoirs and uh, things like that. So we have uh, 12 state parks that we kind of rotate through and treat and we go through before and after our treatments and kind of uh, mark the assessment on health metrics and growth ratings on all of our trees. And we, we do see noticeable impact from our treatments in improving the health of our trees at these sites. Um, I do wanna mention uh, hemlock looper. So this is a native uh, caterpillar insect that feeds on hemlocks and in Northern Worcester and Franklin counties last year and the year before we were seeing a really significant population impact and are seeing a lot of mortality in trees 
Um, so the loopers are just these tiny little caterpillars and they just go along and munch on the needles on a hemlock. And they're really like wasteful eaters. They'll just take like one bite, move to the next one, take a bite. But when a hemlock has damage to their needles like that, um, they're not gonna keep a half chewed needle. They are gonna drop their needles. So you can see a lot of defoliation and needle loss. And when a conifer loses its needles, unlike um, a hardwood or something that like our oaks that get defoliated by a uh, spongy moth, it's not able to push out new needles and that tree will, will die. So more commonly, you'll see the biggest impact from, from hemlock looper on like your mid and understory trees. Uh, it usually won't climb all the way up and get the huge mature hemlocks, but in some of the really dense spots we were seeing last year, we, we saw loss of mature hemlocks as well. So it is a native, native insect, um, but it, it does have these periodic outbreaks that causes uh, a significant tree loss. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about red pine scale. I'm sure anyone that's been driving around our state in the last couple of years or just seeing our red pine stands browning out and dying really quickly. Uh, and the red pine scale are these tiny, tiny little scale insects that feed just under the, the scale, uh, the bud scales of the needles on, on the red pines. And the, they're able to impact these red pines really quickly because most of our trees are plantation style. They have these tiny little lollipop crowns. So they don't have a lot of foliage to begin with. Um, and even though these are small insects, they're able to reproduce rapidly, kind of build up their numbers and cause a lot of stress. So we have a lot of areas in our, our DCR parks where these red pines uh, plantations are now in high recreation use around waterways, around reservoirs. Uh, and they are becoming a really significant hazard for us to manage. So it's not, so red pine is native to a little bit north in, in northern New England and the native red pine stands up there also, they do have some impact from red pine scale. But here in Massachusetts, all of our red pine are, are these plantations that have other stressors from being overcrowded plantations that haven't been managed and most are, are hitting around, they're, they're gonna be 100 years old soon. So they, they're getting up there in age and when they're unmanaged, they're kind of really dense and it, the insects able to move really quickly through those stands. So when we do our aerial surveys, it's really obvious for us to pull out some of these red pine stands. They just really stand out because they change really quickly and decline. And it's not a big impact to our, our landscape and our forest since it is a planted style, but it is, uh, it, it is a challenge for resource managers and does become a public safety issue in a lot of areas. Um, so jumping into emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer, I'm sure all of you have heard about it many, many times. We have had it here in Massachusetts uh, since 2012. It was first detected out in Michigan in, in 2002 and has rapidly spread. I think we're up to it's in 30, I think eight US states. It's also in multiple Canadian provinces and it is devastating to our ash resources. So here in Massachusetts, we have found it through most of the state. And I will say the areas we haven't found it, it doesn't mean it's not there. Those are, most of those areas are either areas that we just haven't surveyed really heavily or they're areas where ash are just not a significant um, component of our, our forest. So out on the Cape and islands, there's just not a lot of ash out there to get infected. Um, it is not that it's not out there, it's just that we haven't found it yet. So. We are reaching a point here in Massachusetts where it is present throughout our landscape uh, and causing significant damage. So emerald ash borer is a small jewel colored beetle. It lays its eggs right in the cracks and crevices of the bark. Um, they will burrow down and, and feed in the cambium layer just under the bark. And as you get more and more of the beetles feeding and creating these serpentine galleries, it eventually will girdle and kill a tree. And it usually takes around five years, five to seven years from initial infestation to tree mortality. And sometimes that can be a little bit longer in areas where you have really healthy ash and um, environmental conditions keep the EABA population growth slow. It can be a little bit faster in areas where your trees are really stressed out already um, and you have a lot of population pressure from EAB. 
but here in Massachusetts, we're kind of reaching that, that five to seven year threshold in many of these areas. And I'm sure as you are out and about in our forests and our communities and driving around, you, you probably have noticed quite a few declining, declining ash. And this time of year, it's actually usually my favorite time of year to actually survey for ash and look for declining things. Because uh, throughout the winter, woodpeckers will feed on the larvae that are under the bark and cause very noticeable damage. Um, so their little feet climbing up in the tree will cause blonding and, and some of the bark to slough off. And they will cause these really ragged holes when they peck in to get the larvae out. So um, ash decline really quickly. They are a tree that becomes brittle really rapidly and just kind of start to fall apart as soon as you start to see canopy damage. So I encourage people that are starting to see like a tree in the middle picture where you might still have green canopy and your tree might technically be alive, but those sections that you're having die back and, and mortality is soon to come. And if you get a good winter storm or a summer thunderstorm, you may have branches falling and becoming a hazard and a risk really quicker than you kind of would expect. Um, I know we've had oaks that died in 2018 from spongy moth and they're still standing out there with all those branches, but oaks are a little, a little more uh, durable in that way than, than ash can be sometimes. Uh, there are pesticide treatment options for ash. Um, when my team does treat, we use MMectin benzoate products. Um, but when you do choose to treat an ash, you have to be really thoughtful with, with making that decision. It can be really expensive. It can be really time consuming. You have to keep returning back to that tree on a two to three year interval to treat. Um, and your tree has to be sturdy enough to do it. So a lot of urban trees are not good candidates because they have like mechanical damage from like uh, lawnmowers and weed whackers and snow plows. And when you kind of have those damage, um, if you're injecting these chemicals into the tree, it might not move up fully throughout the tree. So it might get like trees will route around damage. Um, so you might be having sections of your canopy where you're not getting full coverage from these pesticides. And if you have an urban tree and part of it is still not protected and getting infected, it, it doesn't really make the treatments worth it. But my team does treat, we treat some, we're working on a project to treat old growth ash in, in forested areas to kind of protect that resource. So there are options, um, they can be really effective, but it does take some consideration when you're choosing to follow that. We do release biocontrol species here in Massachusetts. Uh, we've released three parasitic wasp species, um, Spaceus scalinae, Tritasticus planipensiae, and Ubius grilli. So Spaceus and Tritasticus are both larval parasitoids. So they have, it looks like a stinger, but it is not. Um, it is, they use that to actually inject their egg through an ash tree's bark and into the larvae of the EAB that are under the bark in that cambium layer. And then the ubius is an egg parasitoid, so it will inject its egg inside of the EAB egg. Um, so we have released these at um, over 20 sites here in Massachusetts. Um, we've released in every county that we have detected EAB, except for Suffolk County, because it is hard in an urban environment to, to release these. Uh, and we're, we've had good success. Um, it seems that they're establishing. It will not necessarily protect this generation of ash trees, but it is a tool that will be on the landscape as kind of this in, initial wave of VAB moves through and we have the next generation of ash coming up. Um, we'll have something out on the landscape to be a population control and, and maybe slow the long-term impact and allow ash to remain on our landscape into the future. Uh, so we, we've, We've been releasing for a number of years, but this year we will, the only releases in Massachusetts will be for research. Um, there, we get all of our biocontrols from a USDA rearing facility out in Michigan. And since so many states have AB and there's a lot of new states and new county detections, those are kind of the priority for releases. And since we are getting to a point we're seeing so much mortality in our ash here in Massachusetts, um, we kind of need to reassess since you do need a site that is infected, but has enough healthy ash to, that will be on the site for the next few years for, to allow these um, biocontrol populations to grow and reproduce and keep spreading. But it does seem like it is 
unlike our hemlock bully adelgid biocontrols where we have struggled to have success, um, this seems to be a much more effective biocontrol program. Um, and finally, on to the Asian longhorn beetle. So we have ALB here in Massachusetts in Worcester County. Um, there is a 110 square mile quarantine area and we have a cooperative program between um, my, my team with the DCR and the USDA APHIS. Um, and we are out there trying to eradicate this, this insect from our landscape. And I love getting to talk about the work I do and these insects and diseases, but a lot of times it can, it can sound really negative, especially when I throw it out there all at once. Um, and uh, most of the, the insects and diseases we have, once they're established in our forest, we are not able to eradicate them. They are just going to be part of the forest and we can take mitigation actions, but we'll never be able to fully remove it. ALB is different that we are able to eradicate it and we have this program to, to completely remove it from our landscape. Um, part of that is because it's really big and it is rather lazy. Uh, they make very noticeable damage on trees. Uh, they have a slower life cycle. It takes about two years from when an egg is had, uh, laid until an adult beetle emerges. So all of that helps us being able to actually target, survey for this insect and uh, remove it from the landscape. So since the, the program started in 2008, we have been finding less and less infected trees here in Massachusetts. So um, from 11,000 trees in 2009, um, last year in 2020, we didn't find a single infested tree. So it is the first year we found no infested tree during our survey effort. So we are getting closer and closer to our, our goal of actually completely eradicating ALB from our, our forest. We still have a few years ahead of us. Um, 110 square miles is a large area to cover and survey. So you may, if you are out in that central Massachusetts area, you may see our survey teams out on the ground with binoculars and flagging, looking around at trees, our climbing teams out in trees and in our residential areas. Uh, you may notice our traps that we hung. We are gonna hang about 300 traps throughout the quarantine area this, this upcoming year. Um, and once again, if you see us out there, always feel free to say hi, ask some questions. Um, so we are, we are definitely making progress in this and we'll hope to uh, eventually be able to declare I'll be completely eradicated from Massachusetts. All right, my final climate, uh, final poll question. Um, and then for those of you that had uh, done all of this series and saw Dr. Barker uh, Plotkin's presentation, you'll know that climate change is, is a major concern with forest health and kind of these invasive forest pests and kind of our future of our, our actions here and these impacts. So. My last question kind of pulls from everything today. So climate change will alter the impact of which invasive pests in Massachusetts? A, Southern Pine Beetle, B, Hemlock Willia Delgid, C, Lymantria dispar, also known as spongy moth, D, all of the above, or E, none of the above. Sorry, right, folks, had a little technical difficulty there at the moment. Now the poll question is up now.
We'll do 10 more seconds for this poll. Tony, my screen is frozen. Can you close it? There we go. And here are the results. 90% said all of these uh, insects will be affected by climate change. Let me know if you need me to help move back to her slides. You need to move her back to the slides, please. Okay, let's see. Do I remember how to do that? <laughs> uh, let's. Okay, I think you're good, Nicole. Okay, okay. sorry Thank about you. that. Okay, so um, yes, climate change is going to impact a lot of our invasive insects that are already here, uh, impact the ones we're at risk for, and may even alter the impact of some of our native insects, like we're seeing a big outbreak of hemlock looper right now. Um, which sometimes can be impacted by by the changing climate conditions. But I don't I don't want it to seem like just because we have these invasive species that we're not going to have forests and we're not going to have trees. Um, this picture is the Quabbin Reservoir as it was getting filled in the 19 late 1920s and 1930s. Um, and at this point, there was already spongy moth established in this area, and we were already getting spongy moth outbreaks um, in this area. So. Uh, this was heavily farmland, heavily cleared for the development of the reservoir, uh, a lot of open landscape, not a lot of trees. Um, and this is the Quabbin today. It is a deeply forested area. We have a ton of oak trees and oak forests there uh, that were able to grow up and develop even though there were these invasive species present. So we will still have trees in our landscapes, um, even with new invasives, even with our changing climate, it just might be a little bit different than what we are used to and um, might need a little assistance along the way to help us continue to have these resilient forests. Uh, so I threw a lot of information out there, but if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out. Um, my team and I love getting a chance to answer questions for people. Uh, we have a lot of good information on our mass.gov site and in our story map. Uh, and we try to keep that updated throughout throughout the summer. It's, there's nothing too exciting or new through the winter, but once we kind of get going in the spring, we, we update with all of our information we're gathering. And if we have any updates to any of our maps, it's, it's all posted up there. So uh, I think we have a little bit of time for some questions if Tony has them for me. Oh yes, there are plenty. So I will get started. Um... Oh, a question from Phil. How long does the aerial survey take to complete? Uh, usually like four days, four very long, uncomfortable days. It it seems glamorous and fun, but I get very air sick, so it is rough. <laughs> oh no, sorry to hear that. Um, let's see. Um, Michael, is there anything that looks like beech leaf disease but is not? So any lookalikes? Um, if you think you are seeing it, are you most likely seeing it? Last summer, I was not sure sometimes if I was seeing drought symptoms or beech leaf disease symptoms. It So after you see it a couple of times, it's, it's very obvious. Um, and kind of what makes it stand out from other leaf damage is that it is, um, it's darker than the leaf color. So it is a band that will be a darker, like on your traditional leaf, green leaf, uh, beach, it'll be a darker colored band and it is a continuous band. So sometimes it will like brown up or look different later in the season or as you get into the fall color change. Uh, but things like um, like there's mites and flies and anthracnose and other things that will cause banding, that will cause damage on the leaves. But usually those are lighter in color or brown and they're like little, they're like more circulars that are not always connected in a nice consistent stripe. So that's how I usually tell. It can be more challenging in some of the um, different cultivars of the European beech 
So you can still see that consistent band, but you need to like get up closer to really look at it. Um, and it will be darker than the leaf color, but when you already have dark leaves and if the color, the, like the sun's not at the right setting that day, it can be a bit more challenging. Thank you. Um, I think one more beech leaf disease question was on your website, <clears throat> Can you please explain how to find the reporting form for beech leaf disease again? It's a little difficult to find. It is not up yet. So we have, um, we're going to be putting up our new one for 2023, um, probably the first week of April, just before leaf out. So it'll be ready. So it is not, not there yet, but it will be there this spring by the time leaves are starting to pop. Thank you. Um, Let's see here. Oh, I am. So there was one question about are they reporting a lot of mortality in Ohio from beech leaf disease? I think Dr. Mara had mentioned that. If you have any comments, you can add. But I also want to get to some of these other pests. Um, the next question would then be why was there one southern pine beetle trap way up in western Massachusetts? Okay, um, so first the, the beech leaf disease one, they do see mortality in Ohio, but it does seem like it's progressing a little bit quicker out, out east here, uh, but we don't know why yet. And uh, the one spot out in uh, north central Massachusetts is the Montague Plains, uh, which is a really cool spot. If you haven't been there, I would really encourage you to, to check it out, um, but it is a natural pitch pine stand out in Central Mass. Uh, it is owned by Mass Wildlife uh, and they've done a lot of um, management out there. So it is, it's a really cool spot that just happens to be a naturally occurring pitch pine stand. Thank you. Another Southern Pine Beetle related question. Um, can you speak to what are some of the other pine hosts that are susceptible to Southern Pine Beetle or is it just specific to pitch pine? Um, most of the other ones are like not really common here. So like, like loblolly and longleaf pines uh, are in the south. But here in Massachusetts, it's, it's really mostly pitch pine. If you have like planted jack or black pine, those can also be infested. Um, red pine can also be somewhat susceptible, but it is, it is mostly pitch pine that is a uh, it's preferred, it's going to be drawn to that. Any other pines that get in, infected or infested are just going to be ones that are adjacent to really high populations. Thank you. All right, let me see another question here. Oh, what is the treatment for southern pine beetle? Where in the southeastern part of the state was it found? Um, so we found it down in Mashpee in the highest numbers this year and in the trees um but we were we were catching it throughout the cape and and both martha's vineyard and nantucket so it is present out in the landscape pretty much everywhere we have pitch pine um and really once you have a true outbreak and like you have a significantly infested tree removal is the only option that's going to slow that population down and stop it so um, like in Long Island, when they approach it, they will cut all standing infested trees. And if it's in a forested area, they'll cut a buffer strip around it to, to slow the, the insect from moving rapidly to adjacent trees. There are not really good insecticides that slow it or prevent it. Um, sometimes in the South, they'll like push and pull it based on using pheromones, but that doesn't seem to be quite as effective. In, in pitch pine stands just because they're really crowded and dense. Um, they use that more in like thinned out timber stands in the south. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to put in another mention for folks that need pesticide or association credits. Please stay with us through the questions and uh, wait for the instructions at the end of the webinar today. Okay, Jay is asking, are you seeing an increase in diseases, and I'm not sure I'll say this one properly, um, diseases like doth, doth this stroma, doth a stroma? I don't know if I know that one. I don't know if I know that one either. 
Maybe I will ask Jay to put a common name in there for that, uh, and I'll move to another question. Uh, and I'm sorry, Nicole, you might have just answered this, but I was helping another person. Michael asks, how great is the risk that white pine could become a host? Did you just answer that? <laughs> Uh, for southern really pine low. beetle yeah super low risk they they'll only like if there's one white pine in a dense stand of pitch pine that's infested it it might get infested but they're not gonna go out of their way to get to a, a white pine okay great thank you um Ad adrian asks i have birds eating the Oh, actually, it's just a comment. I have birds eating the egg masses of spongy moth on a two acre property that was hard hit by them this past year. I don't know if you want to add to that at all. Um, it is, so there are a lot of our native birds and small mammals will eat spongy moth, uh, which is, I love seeing it. I love getting to a stand where I can tell they just got ripped to shreds by mice. But um, there's always just more, especially when you have these big populations, there's just more egg masses hiding out there. Thank you. Another question. Um, asking about treatment for spongy moth in Sharon, Connecticut and areas in and around New York, they saw complete devastation and could not keep up with the numbers as far as applying uh, chemical or insecticide uh, applications or even naturally based products. Um, is can there be some discussion around what treatment options there are if we have time? Yeah, I'd say so. When you when we do have these severe outbreaks, um, really the most effective treatment is a treatment with a BT product done by um, a professional arborist that has the equipment to actually be able to get it through the foliage. Um, and you want to you want to treat like almost as soon as they hatch. So when they're still like really small caterpillars, they're just getting up into that, those oak canopies, uh, you wanna use a BT product and it, you want an application that's gonna cover the, cover the canopy. So um, there's not, it's usually pretty specialized. There's not a ton of companies that always do that kind of work because you need like to really like get, get up there and do it. And some have like uh, pressure things from the ground, they can do it or some go up in bucket trucks and they'll spray around the foliage. So that is that is by far the most effective. Um, there are other chemicals you can use a little bit later when the caterpillars are larger, um, like spinosad, which are effective, but a little bit more harmful to other uh, insects in your, in your landscape. Um, and usually by the time the caterpillars are larger, they've already done a significant amount of damage feeding. Um, so I would, that is what I say is, is probably your best option if you do choose to treat, but it can be, it can be costly um, and timing it is very important. Thank you. Jay got back to us about Dothish, Dothistroma, a red banded needle disease in three needle pines. And of course, I always say this of everyone in the audience, we have a highly educated audience with us. <laughs> Gary is offering that. This is a needle blight of pine trees that causes needles to turn brown and fall off. Severe infection for several years in a row can cause tree death. Um, they're managing this disease by maintaining good air circulation, mulching and preventing sprinklers from spraying needles. Austrian pine and ponderosa pine are most likely to be damaged by this disease. Red pine and Scots pine are mostly resistant. And then fungicides can be used to protect trees from Dothostroma needle blight. Um, I wish my colleague Nick Brzee was on the line here because I would pass this along to him as he's our pathologist here with UMass Extension. Um, but uh, I, Nicole, unless you want to add anything to that, we can move on to more entomology related questions. Um, I will say that in our pitch pine stands the last few years, there has been a lot of um, needle funguses, and I also rely heavily on Nick because pathology is challenging. Um, and I believe most of those were lophodermum uh, of what we're seeing really commonly in our forested landscape lately. Um, so I don't think we see much dipstroma, luckily, um, but we do see some needle casts that, that have been negatively impacting our, our pitch pine forests. And then we have the abundance of needle cast funguses that are on our white pines as well. Thank you. Let's see here. Um, 
A question from Joe, wondering if you know what was killing hemlocks in Winchenden, Mass. And I want to make sure I don't forget to ask this one on behalf of Brad. Um, what is what is the type of eradication that's being used for ALB? Is it chemical or biological? Um, so sorry to give you two at once, but okay, very easy one. Um, so the Winchenden hemlocks they are in the area with hemlock looper. So uh, we are seeing a really significant outbreak in that area over the last three years of the the caterpillar feeding. You'll see them basically from June into July. You'll, you'll notice them hanging from the trees and, and munching around, but they are a native caterpillar going after our trees. And um, so ALB, unfortunately, the way we control it is if an infested tree is found, that tree is destroyed. So the tree is um, chipped so that it is less than one by one inch uh, sizes that they cannot survive in and the stumps are ground. So it is uh, a bit, uh, it's a destructive, method, but it is thorough and it is very effective. Um, a lot of communities in Worcester and Shrewsbury, Auburn, Holden, Boylston, and West Boylston lost a lot of trees to ALB over the last decade, um, but that those removal of those trees have been able to allow us to limit the spread and to um, work towards eradication. Thank you. Great. Let's see here. Oh, I do want to make sure I get us out at noon as promised. Let me ask, oh dear, just one more question from Karen. If a tree with emerald ash borer is cut down, can it be moved to another site within the same town to be chipped? Uh, yes. So our restrictions in Massachusetts, we actually, we don't have uh, regulations that restrict the movement within the state. Um, we just have restrictions when you're moving wood outside of the state. But I do encourage people to try to minimize any, any movement. So usually staying within a community is a great, great option. So if you're going to chip, chipping is probably the best to, to make sure you're not spreading any EAB. Um, but if you are going to keep the wood in the community, using it for firewood, cutting it, splitting it um, and keeping it local is also an option. Awesome. Thank you so much. You know what? Let me just sneak in if in like one sentence, are you often finding EAB resistant white ash? We are not to that phase yet, um, just because we're still getting through that, that first major hurdle of mortality. So there's trees that look fine, but they just might be still earlier in the infestation. I know out in the Midwest, they have found some sites where they've had nearly half of trees in a stand being able to survive. Uh, but here in Massachusetts, we're, we're not to that point yet where we can identify if we're having survival. Should Thank you so much, it. Nicole. And I just have to add uh, from our friends up in Maine, they are saying, please do not bring your firewood to Maine. It is not legal to cross the border into New Hampshire or Maine. So the regulations or movement that Nicole was just discussing is specific to Massachusetts, uh, but other states have different rules. So in general, as Nicole said, just don't move firewood around large distances, buy it locally. Does that capture it, Nicole? Yes, yep. And always, if you're going somewhere new, research. It's it, Don't Move Firewood is a great website that has a lot of information about most states' rules and regulations and can head you in the right direction. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nicole. And I'm seeing folks saying the same in the chat, but thank you. Excellent presentation. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. I love